welcome Francesco and uh, Israel with the talk Diango Migrations Without Downtime. So, hello. Uh, I'm Francesco. I work for Travelperk and Isra is one of my colleagues. We work, both work as uh, software engineers. And let's deep dive in the topic. So what we do, what our company does, is basically provide a solution to uh, buy, uh, to, to, to book and manage the business travel as a whole thing. So whatever is related to the, from the booking to the uh, management and to the post booking and everything is, can be done in the platform. So what we offer uh, to be different than others is that we have a huge inventory. Uh, we have unified payment and invoicing system. We also offer like many options to uh, upload the users in the platform and sync them like in a real time. Something like Bamboo HR, if you know it. Something like it's called Scheme is another protocol that we use to sync users. But those are like a little bit technical. Also, from a business point of view, we offer the possibility to uh, define different policies and different approval processes. Because in some companies, there is the need to control what the employees are booking. Uh, also, reporting, cost management, uh, and carbon offsetting, which is like a huge topic for us right now. So what we offer is the possibility to contribute in, uh, in being more green, let's say. Uh, also, uh, we have different pricing levels, so any company can decide uh, what they need uh, for their business. And we have an, an amazing 24-7 customer service. If I, can, if I can add something, probably if you have been, since you came here to the conference, and you have, if you have been in a company with a lot of people, you can see the pain that it can be sometimes for having one central person, like having to manage all the, all the travel for everyone because you need to ask for all the data, uh, the passport, whatever, everyone has to book, send all the, send the final confirmation emails with the codes to everyone. So one thing that we, we do in the platform, we start to do from the beginning is empower the travelers to book the travel themselves within a policy. So if you are an employee in the company, instead of having to contact the office manager or the travel manager of the company, you can book your own travel using the payment methods of the company that can be like a bank transfer or SEPA debit. So it's much easier for, for everyone in the company instead of having to have one central point, which is a lot when the company is big. So that's the, for me, is one of the big value proposals for companies. So, okay, what we are talking today is about uh, doing up modifications and changes to the database without causing a disruption of the service. Because as you see, as you saw before, we are providing the solution as a service online. So what we want to avoid is for our clients to experience like disruption in their service uh, once we update the database. But we are going a little bit uh, down now for some basics. Uh, and we will talk about uh, models in general. We are we'll talking about migration and then Isra will uh, explain the strategy we are using to avoid the, down the actual downtime. So what are migrations? First, let's talk about the models. <laughs> it's a funny one. <laughs> so the models are basically what Django uh, provides us to model the schema in the database. So we have in the code the representation that uh, we want to give to the tables. Let's say you can define the same constraints and the same options that you can define at the database level, but in Python, let's say. So what you see there is like a basic example of a model that can have two fields. One is question text, one is pub date, and how it is mapped in the, into the uh, SQL uh, DDL, which is, uh, you can see that in the model we have two fields, and in the create table we have three, because Django by default provides uh, the ID uh, as an auto increment. But let's go to the migrations now. So what is a migration? Migration is what Django provides us to actually apply modifications to the database. So what we want, for example, adding a field, deleting a field, adding a default value for a, uh, for a column to the database, whatever is impacting the, at a schema level, the changes uh, that we do at the model is done via migration uh, with Django. 
So this is just a simple representation of what happens. So when we want to change the model A to A1, what Django does is we, what we need to do is actually create the migration. It's done by this command called make migration, and it generates basically a meta language that contains a SQL that is actually applied when we go to production to actually modify that table. And in the migration file, you can review the changes if you want to take a look to everything. Uh, so it's let's say it's split in two phases. First, we create the first Django creates this migration file. It's called migration file. And then when uh, running when going in production, you need to actually apply the migration. This is an example. As you see, uh, so all the migrations extend from migrations.migration, .migration, which is the Django class for it. The dependencies uh, explains, let's say, are explaining what are the previous migrations that need to be run before running this one. And the operation is what actually was going on with the migration. In this case, there is a, a field, uh, a model triple that gets deleted, so the table gets eliminated. And the migration adding a field is adding the rating field to the author model uh, that is an integer. So. That's roughly uh, like this simple migration, what it's doing. Uh, this is a graph that explains the flow that uh, happened with the migration. So as you can see, it kind of looks similar like the git flow. Because what it's saying is, starting from the migration uh, 1a to b 3c, there is like a branching. Uh, because like the 4d1 and the 4d, are actually depending only on the tree C, so they can go in parallel. And then once everything gets merged, let's say after like a few other migrations, everything goes linear again. Uh, the, the representation that you see on the right after the command show migration is basically, uh, show migration is the command that shows uh, all the migration that are applied to the current database level. So in that case, when, when you run show migration, if you see what's shown there, so 0, 1 initial, 0, 2 auto, it means that the one with the X has been applied already on the database. The second one is not yet applied. So you need to run a specific command to, a specific command to, to do it, as I said before. Uh, let's go to the next. Yeah, this is just a repetition. Uh, sorry. Um, this is just to wrap up a little bit what I said before. So the, the, the workflow that happens when uh, we need to execute a migration, it just uh, running the command that is uh, listed there, that is the migrate command. Uh, and the running migration report is basically what's going on in production. If you see the logs, you would see this, because every migration that gets applied is logged with an OK or KO in case it's not going well. Uh, so this is just a recap of the commands that can be run uh, to handle migration. The migrate, as I said before, is the way we have to actually apply the migrations in the database. Make migration is to create the migration file from the change to the model that we're doing. So when we change the model, we always need to, to run make migration to generate the migration file so the same change can be applied at the database level because otherwise there is the possibility that the model and the database are not aligned, and this can be like mm, quite a big problem. The SQL migrate is like a tool that you can use to actually inspect the SQL that is generated for my, uh, for, from my migration file. So it's just if you want to be more on control of what's going on, you can run this command, and you can see what is actually happening at the database level. And the show migration, as we showed before, is just to see which migration have been applied already and which are not yet. So now I leave the word to Isra. OK. So if you got a bit confused by all what we said, it was just an introduction. We, the purpose of the talk was not to talk about how migrations work, but to avoid downtime. It was just a bit of context so you understand everything. OK, so don't worry. Now I'm going to talk, now that we are introduced models and migrations, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the main purpose of the talk, which is downtime when you're applying migrations and why they happen and how can we try to avoid them. OK? So 
Okay. The what we want to say is why why do they happen? And uh, there are two reasons that why they can happen. The first one is that uh, usually when you want to have a when you're running an application that you don't want to have downtime, you need to uh, deploy a new version of the app while the previous version is running. So you don't like stop the previous version, then apply the migration, apply the change to the database, and start the new one. Because there, will, there can be even if it's seconds, these seconds can mean a lot in certain systems. So you don't want that. So what you do, I think I have a graph here. Yeah. You deploy the new version of the app while the previous version is running. And then this creates an issue. Why? Because you can have two versions of the app, the old one and the new one with the new models in Python running at the same time, but you cannot have two schemas of the database. I don't know, perhaps there are some databases that allow that, but you, you cannot have two schemas. When you run the migration, you apply a change to the schema, and then it's a different one. Perhaps you, are, you had a field that was nullable before, and now it's not nullable, so it cannot run with both uh, versions at the same time. Okay, then the, well, you can see that in the graph, the two, the two versions, uh, at some point there are two of them running, but the database schema changes when you uh, apply the migration, that is a separate command, okay? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so what happens if you are, for example, del what? deleting a model? Are you, yeah, okay, you did it on purpose. What happens if you are deleting a model, for example, and that model was in use by the, by the application? What happens if you change a field or delete a field? And this field, of course, it was being used. It cannot be OK. Or you change attributes. Like, for example, you make a field not nullable. And then every time the other app tries to create that model or change something and it's, this is nullable, then OK, then it's going to fail. OK, then to, in order to avoid that, basically a rule of thumb is that to have backwards compatibility. Every time you make a change, you need to make the new schema compatible with the old application. And we will see, you know, we are, I'm trying to introduce the main reasons it can, uh, we can have downtime, and later, under the rules of thumb, and later we will see some examples of uh, like the typical operations that we do, and how can we avoid that, okay? This is the main thing to consider. Whenever you are running this, take this into account. The new version has to be compatible with the, with the old app, okay? And then the second reason that the second main reason that you can have downtime is the logs in the database. Basically, whenever you have a data structure that you, where you need to perform certain operations, uh, in order to, to have certain guarantees of the like, reliability of the data, that different operations see the same data, et cetera, et cetera, there are mechanisms called logs that prevent multiple operations that are not compatible among them to have these guarantees run simultaneously. Because if they run simultaneously, you can have inconsistent data. If you are, I don't know, deleting a field at the same time updating, it doesn't make sense. Then it doesn't, it doesn't work. So in order to do that, well, in this case, in our company, we use Postgres. I guess that in MySQL, there can be similar things. But uh, the date, all, all data systems implement a mechanism called logs, where they uh, basically, when there are two operations, they, depending on the kind of uh, exclusivity that they need in the operations, they say, okay, I lock this, for example, this row of the, or this table, and nothing can write there, for example. And until, I perform, until I finish this transaction, the next operation cannot do anything. This way, you stop the, the Armageddon there, and, and you, you know that you're not like, breaking anything in the data. Imagine it's a bank, and you do like, multiple, imagine you do double transactions or stuff like that. So you want to be able to lock stuff so even things could happen concurrently, you don't do that in order to avoid mistakes, OK? I said a lot of things, but then the problem with this is that almost always, well, it's very fast, whenever there's a, um, a migration and you have an alter table statement, for example, adding a field or changing something, I think that all, almost all alter table statements, which are the ones like use migrations, uh, acquire a kind of lock that is called uh, uh, access, I think it's called there, access exclusive on the table that is being modified. What does this mean? This means that basically it for it stops all, all when it's running, no other operation, no other transaction can run on the same table. Then what happens? That if you have uh, another table that takes a long time, 
then even if it's like just reading and really it was not important because it could be you're just I don't know adding a field okay you're adding a field and then you are reading from other fields it's not it's not important but the table is locked so nothing can read from that table and then if the transaction that alters the table takes a long time for any reason then and and if this long time is obviously subjective it can depending on the on your SLI of your application if your application needs to return I don't know your Google and you need to return in less than I don't know 100 milliseconds five seconds can be a lot some other companies okay you can afford more downtime is okay but if this is longer and the more data you have usually if there are rewrites of table and stuff like that the longer the other table takes because sometimes they have to rewrite the entire table and it takes a long time then you need to control for this and you, you need to be aware of the uh, of the other table locking the table the tables even for reads and for everything okay uh, yep uh, here you have like a representation okay for where there are some transactions in, in database operations there are always transactions so there can be some transaction at some point we introduce the the fifth transaction which is the migration where we are doing the the migrate command that we saw before and then there was this sixth transaction that could have run perhaps in that table but the fifth one was locking the table so the fifth so perhaps the, the the sixth one was super fast but since the previous one started earlier then now it cannot it cannot work and it can take I don't know one minute if, even if it was fast because it arrived too late okay because the table is locked easy uh, uh, um, okay uh, an important thing to highlight here is something that is not very well known is that uh, <laughs> this is a complex thing the locks on the tables what what at least Postgres does it has a uh, first in first out it has a queue of the of the locks to acquire so in this case I'm gonna put all, all these things okay so it's easy to see you have for example one long running query for example a select or account on on a table a very big one uh, and then imagine it takes I don't know 30 seconds to run and then while it's running my on the second one it you apply the migration I say okay it needs to alter that table but that other select query is running then when you do the alter table what Postgres does it uh, since the select is running and the alter table cannot cannot acquire the lock on the on that table because there's another transaction it waits for the lock but then if if another operation comes the next operation cannot either go and select and do any operations on the table because there was a long running one the third one is compatible with the first one but the second one is in the middle it does I I don't know why it's like that but I guess that is because otherwise imagine that then okay we say okay the first one is compatible with the third one then we let the third one pass but then the other table in, in some scenarios can perhaps if there are a lot of transactions perhaps it never runs so it has a queue so it says before if this operation has not finished yet the next one cannot come so you have a very busy table where there are a lot of uh, some cases where the transactions that run very long even if the other table is is uh, is short in time the long running query is the one that is gonna like make the rest of the transactions later queue up and then cause down time and this has happened to us a lot and you say why, why is this happening because we had some query that was like for five seconds and it was locked so yeah that's what I said okay then uh, rough of thumb for this to try to avoid this first the SQL migrate command that Francesco was talking about every time you you are running a migration check the SQL is being run uh, so this way you can check documentation and try to understand which kind of locks are acquired and try to prevent like bad things happen happening especially if they are big tables or uh, yeah they are big or busy tables because the big tables usually takes more time um, then the second thing is there are some operations that need to rewrite the whole table it was the case I will talk later of Postgres uh, when you were applying a non nullable default it had to rewrite the whole table so it's a big one and you have the other table in a transaction then it you say okay at this default by default the value has to be three I, or zero in this new field that I add okay but it, before it had to rewrite the whole table and it took a long time if it's millions of records and it locks for that time and it's terrible in some cases there you can do other tables with less restrictive locks which is good then because then uh, it's um, 
uh, is you have less chances of everything blocking. And if uh, the, those restrictive loads are unavoidable, an important thing is that to run the locking things separated from the rest. For example, you have a migration, and later you have to do a data migration, which is like changing some data, run them in different transactions. Why? Because you put them in the same transaction, the lock is going to be held until the end of the transaction, even if the other table was fast. Or you, you, put, you can put the first one, the order doesn't matter, but the locks are per transaction. So then you uh, yeah, separate them. You separate them, the, lo the, the stronger lock, the access exclusive lock, we will have for a short time, and then you have the long running operation that is compatible with all the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and then for the last part, we are gonna, I think we have, it's good because we are on time, I'm gonna like show some examples of typical operations where you can have downtime and how to avoid them. Okay, this is the, the important thing perhaps for some people. Uh, that said, probably you, you look for, for, for this topic online, you, you will find a lot of people talking about this and telling how to avoid this, so probably better explain that we are explaining here. So yeah, yeah, it's, for me at least, we are not trying to show you ex uh, to have an exhaustive list of, of all the possible cases, just to show you the, the typical cases, then you, you look up online, you will find documentation where you have every case and why, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I don't know, you can see this, it's not very easy, it's my fault, I don't know how to do slides that work in, <laughs> in, uh, in these things. Yeah, uh, adding a normal field. Uh, adding a field is normally safe because uh, at least now in, in uh, starting with Postgres 11, even if you have a non-nullable default, it doesn't need a full rewrite on the table. Before, it had to do a full rewrite that took a really long time to, to run. So, uh, and wh why is this is because, I don't know if you know, but Django keeps the, um, keeps the default in the code, not in the database. So when you added a non-nullable non field with a, so an, or even a nullable field with a default, it had to first add, uh, add the column with the default value and then drop the default. And this adding the column with the default value was, that was, uh, is what was making uh, rewrite the whole table. So the imp important things, this second thing is already solved, otherwise you had to resort to nasty tricks you can find somewhere else. And uh, important thing to avoid the first problem that I talked about, which was the two versions of the same app running at the same time, is that the new field has to have a null equal true. Why? Because the old version of the app will try to write in that model and say, okay, put this data, and obviously there's a field that is missing, and then it will fail. So say, okay, this uh, uh, file constraint, this field has to, it cannot be null, and you are making it null. Okay, it's gonna fail. So, nullable. You can make another migration later to make it non nullable, but nullable and the other issue, it's okay. Forget about it. Um, adding fields, foreign keys, when you, when you add foreign keys, it needs to acquire a specific kind of lock in the table that you are adding the key and the other table because it needs to check that the, you know how foreign keys work, the version in the first, uh, in the first, the number in the first table has to match another in the second table, otherwise there's an inconsistency. That's the, the basic thing. So, if it's a, if it's a new field and it's not like, and it was not uh, referencing, if it was not a normal field that where you added a foreign key later, usually it's empty, so it doesn't have to check this constraint on a lot of values, so it's usually very fast. So you don't need to do anything, but if you need to turn up, imagine you have normal before an integer field and then you turn into a foreign key, then you need to do a specific trick that we list there, basically is creating the foreign key but without validating it and then later validating it in a different transaction so you can run both things at the same time. And as I put there, that is a fast operation, but remember the issue with the long running transactions. You're adding, when you have a table that has a, uh, some long running transaction and then you add a foreign key to it, then the problem you will have it, is that it will hold this lock and there will be, you cannot do updates on that table until the long transaction uh, ends, finishes running. Five minutes, good. Adding models is very, no, don't worry, it's the same with the foreign key. If there are like long running transactions in, in if you are adding foreign keys to other tables, otherwise it's a new model, you're not really changing anything, just adding a new model. Uh, uh, uh. Renaming field, 
usually you should try to avoid that. Uh, if uh, the column name in the database is not important, you, Django has a mechanism to say, okay, uh, perhaps you want to rename it just to make it more clear for clear for other people. You can just say, okay, the, the old, the, I changed the name of the field in, the, in Python, but the database name is another one. So you can do this. But if you want to change the, um, really want to change the column in the database, then you have to do a lot of nasty things that they write here. You need to create another field. If you don't want on time, you need to create another field, uh, update both, do some data migration so you get all the old values into the into the both fields at the same time and then delete the old one. Because otherwise, we have this issue with adding fields that are, uh, if they are null, if they cannot be null, then you have uh, this kind of issues. You cannot just change it directly because then the it will try to write in the old one and then it won't work the previous version of the app. So like this is how you how you do it. Uh, changing attributes in a foreign key. This is something that hit us hard sometimes. Uh, at least in the past, Django, every time you did any change at all in a field containing a foreign key, it was dropping the foreign key and recreating it again. Of course, if this are if this is a foreign key that references two big tables, it needs to check the constraint in both tables that are, that are being referenced. And as I said, to validate this foreign key constraint takes a long time, and it was like blocking everything there. So this was a big issue. It was improved a bit in Django 3.2, where they added um, where if uh, you are changing some stuff in the field, that doesn't really change the database. Nothing is done. But for some other things, like something that happened to us, you had a field that was uh, non nullable before and you make it nullable and it was still dropping the, the foreign key and recreating it with the same issues as before. You can see there there are Django provides a way to say okay the model changes are this but don't do any operation for example it's called uh, migrations rule sequel or migration separate database and state where you can see where you can say okay the model changes like this but I'm telling you which SQL operations I want to run in order to avoid Django running things on, on its own very nice. Index, indexes. Uh, also, when you add indexes, uh, mm, what happens, Postgres by default, when you're creating an index on a field, okay, let's add an index because the data will be faster because we have this really big table where, uh, of course, we need to run a query and search for things really fast. Let's create the index. Good, nice. But when you create the index, it block writes on the table because the way it computes the index, it needs, okay, you change the values of the, of the table, of course, Something is going to be wrong with the index. So it, then you need you instead of doing the default Django added an operation that it can be done in Postgres, add index concurrently that doesn't block updates, basically. And dropping should fast, should be fast, except on the case of long, other online transactions. Okay, Oopa. delete fields. There's a <laughs> this is a very complicated thing. I, I I don't think I don't have a lot of time, like two minutes. Basically, I wrote here the, the operations that you need to do. We did this multiple times. It's very painful because of the backwards compatibility. If you, you cannot just delete it because obviously the previous app will try to select those fields that were existing in the previous app. So you need to do all these things. First, OK, it's nullable, so I don't write it anymore. Don't use it in the code. Then you delete a field in the model deploy a new version that is not using this field at all, why wait until this is fully deployed? And then and when you have the new code that doesn't use this field at all anymore, then you delete it. But you need to do, run the migration after you deployed the, the new, after the version that doesn't use the field is fully deployed. Because otherwise, the previous version will try to select it. Because Django, when you, when you like uh, query for a model, it tries to get all the fields of the model by default. So you will try to get the field that doesn't exist anymore. So you need to delete it from the model, deploy, and later run the migration. And for deleting models is like similar thing that the previous slide. You, you need to do more or less the same. Like delete the usages, deploy the version, the, the Python version doesn't use those fields anymore. And then after you have done that, then run the migration. You need to stop using the, the those fields and those models in the database in the code before those models and those fields are deleted from the database. Yeah, and that's it. Some links that we use is very, of course, the Postgres uh, documentation. 
that you can check to, to understand more about logs. And some posts that we found useful about some company called Situs Data, where they explain how logs work and, and how to avoid certain situations with logs when you are doing changes in the schema changes in the database. And that's all. As other companies you have seen, we are hiring, obviously. You want to join or you are interested in like business travel for your company as well, talk to us. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. And have a good day.